If you're returning to Elden Ring, maybe trying a new class, or just need a refresher, this video contains early game class guides for every single class except the Wretch, as well as some amazing end game builds for every major stat at the end. So I've got you covered from early game to the end game, all in this one video. Let's go. We'll start off with character creation. Obviously, we're picking the Astrologer here, and the Astrologer's main two stats is Mind to increase your FP, as well as Intelligence for that spell scaling or sorcery scaling. The keepsake that we're going to pick here is probably going to be the Golden Seed. Always pick the Golden Seed. It just gives you an extra flask, which is super valuable in the early stages of the game. The starting gear for the Astrologer, you start off with the Astrologer's armor, which is just relatively decent light gear to wear. You get a pretty basic shield as well as the short sword but for the most part we're not really going to be using that the key is on the astrologer's staff as well as the spells you start out with the glintstone pebble and the glintstone arc the glintstone arc you won't really use too much it's a relatively aoe spell in a cone in front of you but the pebble is what we're going to use all of the time you'll be raining pebbles down on enemies all of the time it has such a low fp cost but does a decent amount of damage and you will just be using this throughout most of the game for your flask choice here you want to stack most into FP, probably have a couple of health potions because if you run out of FP, you're probably going to die anyway. So I would lead towards FP over health. How you play as the astrologer is it's always best to stay at range, basically just spamming the glint zone pebbles until you get better spells. The spirit summons are an absolute must to take away aggro from you so that you can keep raining down those spells. And especially in fights when there are a lot of enemies around, you want to have the spirit summons active so you can prevent them from just all attacking you and so you can keep dodging as well as casting those spells. The only time I'll ever really melee is when a weak enemy has like a tiny little bit of health left and I don't want to waste the last bit of FP just to finish them off. I'll just switch to the short sword, just hit them once and then continue on the way. It's also worth pointing out that you need to be facing the enemy when you're casting your spell. So if you're riding torrent, for example, and you're moving away, you will need to turn around and face the enemy and then line up the shot. This can sometimes be difficult when you are mounted on torrent and I'll occasionally switch switch the short sword in some of these scenarios as well and just employ like hit and run tactics and just sprint past them and just have a big quick swing and it makes it a little bit simpler because it can be difficult to cast spells while on the mount but it is well worth doing regardless of whether you're mounted or on the ground. For your attributes here, we are really just stacking intelligence and mine. Intelligence will increase the overall damage you'll do with your spells and mine to increase your FP total so you can get more spells off before having to use a flask. A little bit of vigor will go a long way here as well, just in case you do miss a dodge, because primarily we are going to be dodging any of the damage that's coming towards us. If you want to have a little bit of vigor so that you can take a hit or two without getting one shot, it's well worth putting a couple of those early points into vigor just to help your survivability. Now, some gear that you need to get very quickly in the game. The first thing you should do is head to the Waypoint Ruins. There is a little mini boss here, but once you have cleared that mini boss, the Sorcerer Selene will be here and she will sell you all kinds of glintstone spells. You can find different scrolls to give her as well, which will increase the amount of spells that she can give you throughout the game. Next, you want to head down past the Limgrave, so down south to the Weeping Peninsula and fight the Demi Human Queen here at the Demi Human Ruins. Once you beat her, you will get the staff, and this is a much better staff and the starting staff the astrologer has it has much better sorcerer scaling and you can also upgrade this staff so definitely worth getting when you're in the catacombs in limgrave the imps down here have a chance to drop an imp helm which will have decent physical resistances on it but it will also give you additional intelligence to your total i think it's two points of intelligence so it's well worth farming these when you are down in the catacombs and when you're exploring throughout the world keep an eye out for memory stones this is how you increase your spell slots you can buy one at the round table hold very early on for 3,000 ruins but keep an eye out for towers and other locations that will have these memory stones. Starting off with character creation, your starting stats for the prisoner is a level 9 and your main stats are dexterity and intelligence both at 14 with vigor and mind at 11 and 12 respectively. You also have a decent amount of endurance which is really positive for the prisoner so then as you develop this spell blade kind of play style you don't really have to put any points into endurance to increase your stamina. For your keepsake, I really think the only option here is golden seed because you get an extra flask by picking the golden seed, it's just valuable for really any build. Your starting gear is 
is pretty solid. You start out with an s dog which is a very well-balanced dexterity scaling weapon. You get the Glintstone Staff, which is a little bit better than the Astrologer Staff that you start out with in that class. And you get the Magic Glint Blade, which is the probably the downside of starting out here. It's the spell you start out with. It's pretty solid. It has a long wind-up time, but later on in this video, I'll tell you how you can get some better spells very quickly in the game. And you start out with the Prisoner Attire. For your flasks here, you want to have an even split between health and FP because we're primarily going to be using a whole lot of magic, so you want to make sure you can actually restore your FP, but also in case you do take damage, it's good to have some health as well. How you play this class is it's really designed as a spell blade, and it's one of the more advanced classes because of its hybrid nature. Primarily, you want to play at range and hit enemies with chip damage with your spells and then finish up with the S-Stock in melee. The S-Stock is a solid deck scaling weapon with a very fast attack animation, so you can often squeeze a quick light attack in between enemies' attack animations while they're still winding up. You want to make sure you're dodging and not blocking attacks for the most part. We will have a staff in our offhand pretty much all the time rather than a shield, so you can't block most of the time, though sometimes if you do happen to run out of FP, it's worth switching to your shield in your offhand so that you can protect yourself a little bit better and maybe block and do some guard counters to deal some damage back at enemies quickly. When you're riding Tor into your mount, you do want to put your staff in your main hand so that you can still cast spells. It's much more efficient to cast spells when you're riding your mount than using the S-Stock, as the S-Stock is a piercing weapon, so you basically point at things with it, you don't slash, which means that the hitbox can sometimes be hard to actually hit enemies with. It's much easier just to use spells and target them directly than having to use the S-Stock. Though you can get away with the S-Stock, I just prefer personally to use the staff in these scenarios. And in a lot of cases, in the very early stages, leveraging magic is very overpowered for a lot of the mini bosses in the catacombs and other mini bosses you might find definitely use a lot of spells and you can really level up quickly by leveraging spells and avoiding the damage coming towards you for your attributes when you are leveling up you primarily want to focus on intelligence this is for your spell scaling as well as your mind stat which will increase your fp total so you can cast more spells i would also suggest to put some minor points into vigor until you can basically guarantee that you're not going to get one shot by a lot of bosses and enemies and once you've kind of hit that point you're pretty much okay as well as then putting some of those additional points into dexterity for your weapon scaling for your main hand weapon that we'll be using. For gear to get early on the main thing you want to do is go to the waypoint ruins and go to Sorceress Selene and buy some of the spells that she has especially the glintstone pebble this will become your primary spell it has such a low cost but does so much damage this is such a valuable spell to have just almost as soon as you get into the game if you book it to the waypoint ruins and pick this up you will definitely succeed more by killing the imps in the catacombs there is a chance that they will drop this imp helmet which will actually give you relatively decent physical resistances as well as an increase to your overall intelligence so it's a great helmet to pick up very early in the game for this build the way you increase your amount of memorized spells is by the memory stones that you can find throughout the world you can also buy one at the round table hold relatively cheaply so you can get this pretty much straight off the bat just to give you some, yourself some extra spells and the other thing I would definitely suggest to pick up is the shield that you can get from the round table hold. Once you have unlocked this just by doing some exploring and unlocking the graces, it will eventually unlock. When you go to the vendor here, you can buy a shield that has a 100% physical resistance, but it also has a low strength cost. So because we don't have a lot of strength, we can still use this shield and block all of the damage coming towards us. It's a better shield than the one you start out with. As you explore, you'll find better armor than the prisoner set and just really equip this as you do see fit. You'll also need to put on some gloves as the set doesn't start with some gloves but as long as you're staying within that medium load range we're not heavy rolling then you're basically fine here to really put on anything that you see fit we will start off with character creation. Now your main stat is going to be Vigor. You do start out as soul level 9 with a Vigor of 15. Next you've got a strength of 14 and a dexterity of 13. So basically the way this works is you've got a lot of health and you can wield some of the bigger weapons by having a decent strength and dexterity. You also have a quality endurance starting at 11. Picking a keepsake is always the golden seed. You get an extra flask, just pick the golden seed and move on. For your starting gear, you start out with a longsword and the halberd. The halberd's okay, but the longsword is the really quality starting weapon here as well as the heater shield which has a hundred percent physical resistance so you can block all the damage coming towards you because we have a decent stamina we can do tons of blocking here your armor is the vagabond knight armor which is quality again so you can tank some of those hits that are coming towards you and for your flask we are going to put all of our flask points into health we don't really use fp here unless you're summoning spirit summons or using ashes of war but it's all about the health here how to play this class is it's really all about tanking damage with the shield and blocking this is a great class for beginners that don't want to use spells 
or if you're not accustomed to using spells and you just want to use all of the melee weapons in combat, you'll mostly be holding your block and tanking the hits that come towards you or blocking them. When appropriate, you can counter with a guard counter by blocking an attack and then heavy attacking as a follow-up, and you will deal this special like attack. You'll hear this little sound, and you'll deal a decent amount of damage. It also does a lot of poise damage, so you can often stagger enemies from this. Even though this is a tank, that doesn't mean you want to take damage. You want to avoid damage as much as possible by blocking it, absorbing it into your stamina, or just dodging it out of the way if you do need to. As soon as you get into Limgrave, you want to unequip that halberd so you no longer have the heavy weight class, which means that you're fat rolling or heavy rolling, so you have that slower animation on your roll. If you unequip the halberd, you'll just have a normal equipped load, so you can then just do the normal roll. Or if you really wanted, you could equip the sword and just rock the halberd. When fighting on torrent, remember that you can swing on either side of the mount with the right and left triggers. Because we don't have any ranged here, you will need to use hit and run tactics on enemies when you're on torrent. It's also worth noting that torrent can actually tank some of the damage for you if you do get hit and torrent gets hit and you don't get hit, you won't lose any health obviously, but torrent will. So you can avoid some damage by just having torrent take that damage for you if you are you know, a bad mount owner, I guess. Other than that though, the only thing to take into consideration is your Ashes of War. On your shield, you start out with parry, which you can use to parry enemies attacks and kind of put them off balance to follow up with a critical hit. Or you can use the kind of stab attack that you get with the longsword. Both of these are it's just simply okay. I don't think either is really strong. You will want to replace the Ash of War that is on your sword as soon as possible with something that is a bit more versatile and valuable to use because you won't really be using your FP in any other way other than the spirit summons. You're only going to be using your FP on Ashes of War. So you want to make sure you have a solid Ash of War to back you up here as this class. For your attributes, strength is the key here with a little bit of dexterity if you want to equip some of the different weapons, but strength is the focus and then vigor and endurance as your two secondary stats. Vigor is obviously for your health, so you can tank some of that damage, but endurance will be really beneficial for you so you can increase your equipped load so you won't be heavy rolling when you equip some of the heavier weapons as well as some of the heavier armor. It'll also increase your stamina and because we want to be tanking that damage into our stamina rather than our health, having a high amount of stamina is beneficial. Also to help you dodge some attacks if you know you are blocking and you want to actually initiate a dodge to really get away from something, you want to have initial stamina so you can do that. For your gear, the great thing about the Vagabond is that you're basically good to go right from the start. All your starting gear is solid. You will find lots of different melee weapons throughout Limgrave and the surrounding areas that you can test out. See what kind of their attack animations are like, the Ashes of War, if you like them, dislike them. If you like them, then just rock it. You know, there's plenty to play around with here and that's one of the benefits of having a melee class like this. The one thing that you should do, which we mentioned earlier, is get better Ashes of War. And the best way to do this is go to the War Master Shack in the world. And there is a vendor here that will sell you Ashes of War that you can equip onto your melee weapons. We'll start out with your initial character creation setup and the main thing with the Confessor is your primary stat is Faith, then followed by Mind and then Strength. You should pick the Golden Seed as your keepsake because the Golden Seed is really the only option. It allows you to get an extra flask. Your starting gear here is relatively solid across the board. The Confessor armor is, has really decent resistances for starting gear. You get an okay shield, the Finger Seal, which allows you to cast those incantations and the starting incantations are Urgent Heal, which is a quick heal that you can initiate an assassin's approach which kind of makes your stealth better and you also get a broadsword. For your flasks you primarily want to stack health with one or two in FP depending on how much you use the incantations. You might actually put more in FP as you learn better incantations and start using them more often. So how do you play as the confessor? This class is really good for new players as you have a decent stat spread while starting out the game with the healing incantation and solid equipment for the most part. With this class you will play similarly to like the vagabond but spring in the occasional incantation. So if you need to heal, you've got the urgent heal that you can initiate rather than just using the flask. The assassin's approach is pretty useless unless you want to be really sneaky, but you don't necessarily need it as stealth is easy enough on its own. And it doesn't really fit well with what the confessor is being this kind of like tankier paladin. It's a weird incantation to start off with, but here's to their own. Be sure to guard counter when you are using the shield with the confessor. When you do this by blocking an attack and then following up with a heavy attack, just be careful not to get hit when you do this if you are using this in the middle of an enemy's attack animation. But basically, you'll play this as a melee character up close and personal. You might take some damage. You want to block some of that damage coming towards you. Strike back with guard counters. Just strike back with your normal attacks and really sprinkle in the faiths as you do see fit. And you could pick up a lot of Ashes of War for this build as well because we're not 
really using a whole lot of FP with the heal initially. So if you do want to pick up some Ashes of War and use them sprinkled throughout your gameplay, it's well worth doing. For your attributes, your key should be either strength or focus, depending on whether you want to lean more into the incantations or more into the strength side. It's really up to you and how you want to play it, but I recommend to go strength so you can pick up some of the better weapons because for the most part, you will be attacking with a weapon, just a standard melee weapon. So you probably want to put some points into strength and dexterity and then maybe a little bit into faith depending on when you find those better incantations. Don't forget about your endurance, which will increase your equipment load as well as your stamina. And then you've also got mine to increase your FP if you do want to go that route as well. Your starting gear as the Confessor is pretty solid. The only thing you should pick up is at the gate front ruins, which you'll go to pretty much straight away. Farm the enemies here that have this nice shiny shield, which can actually drop from their bodies. It'll take a couple of minutes. You will find these enemies throughout as well. So if you don't want to do it here, you can find them later on and farm them. But once they do drop that shield, it's much better than your starting shield. You want to pick that up straight away. Otherwise, once you've done a pretty decent amount of exploring, this happened to me most of the way through Limgrave, you'll get a cutscene and unlock the round table hold. And here is where you can buy more incantations. There's a guy just like the Prophet. He is a vendor that will sell you incantations throughout the game. So keep an eye on his stock and pick the incantations here that you like and play around with them. If you do like the incantations here and want to use them more in combat, then you want to stack faith more than strength. But I initially recommend to go strength rather than faith. Because you will have a bit of strength and dexterity, you will find weapons throughout that you'll be able to use as well. And obviously you can play around with these and find ones that suit you best. But the initial starting broadsword is pretty solid in the early stages. And just don't forget to upgrade your gear as well at the smithing table. Also, if you like what we do here, consider hitting that like button or subscribing or the membership program for just $1. You can get early access to videos like this and all of my other guides, build videos and those cheeky long form essays we do. Plus, there are other benefits like members only channels in the Discord, merch and more. So if you like what we do here, please consider hitting that join button or subscribing as it helps me more than you know. But enough of that, back to the video. Let's get started in character creation. And with the Prophet, you start out at soul level seven. Your main stat here is faith and mind at 14, but everything else is pretty low. You've only got 10 vigor. You've only got 11 strength. Arcane is low. Dex is low. Intelligence is low. Endurance is low. Everything is low. So this class is very difficult to start out with. And we'll talk about how to make this better as you progress through the game. Your starting gear is where it is also a struggle. Now you start out with the Prophet armor, which has good elemental resistances, but very poor physical. You also get the short spear and the rickety shield. The rickety shield doesn't have a 100% physical negation, so you will take some chip damage when you are blocking with this shield. You also get the finger seal, which is how you're going to cast those incantations, as well as heal and catch flame. Heal is a very slow wind up heal, and catch flame is a melee ranged flame spell that does heaps of damage, but it does have a very high FP cost. For your flasks, you want to start with mostly health, and then as you get better at incantations, and start learning some of the better ones, you want to move some of that into the FP range because you will be able to heal that damage that comes towards you rather than using the flask. But in the early stages, you're going to be using the shield and spear primarily. How to play this class is, look, it's really a struggle. Like I definitely 100% struggled. This is like the fifth class that we've done and I definitely struggled in the beginning of the game with the Prophet. I definitely don't recommend this for new players. You start with the very poor armor, the poor shield that I mentioned, the average spells, the low FP total, so you can't even cast the spells that you do have. It can take take some time, but you gotta have faith, get it? The Prophet will come into their own if you put in the time to get those runes, level yourself up and get better gear. In those initial hours before you start finding the better gear, with the spear and the shield, you do want to block pretty much all the time and you can actually hold up your block and then poke the shield because it is piercing. So you can keep your block up while you're doing that. Just be careful of the chip damage you will take and also perform guard counters so you can deal much damage back. And then to bosses and anything else that is hard to kill, you want to use the catch flame spell to melt them down quickly, but rely on the spirit summons to take the aggro away from you so you can just stand behind them and spam the spell. Once you start getting some of the better incantations, the main one you want to use is Flame Sling. This is like a fireball spell that has much better range than the Catch Flame. Catch Flame does do more damage, but you have to be in melee range, so that's the price you pay there. So running both Catch Flame and the Flame Sling so you can deal some melee damage or the range damage with Flame Sling is well worth having. And then later you will pick up something like Flame of Frenzy, which is an AoE spell that will cast kind of any cone in front of you. It does really solid damage and will take out most of the enemies and also leverage the lunge attacks because you 
you're going to be playing in kind of that mid-range distance from enemies, so you can jump and then do a heavy attack to close that distance quickly to deal damage to them. Your attributes for this class is primarily going to be Faith and Mind, but I definitely recommend to put some of those early points into Vigor, because you're going to have very low health to start out with, and the poor armor that you do have, it's going to hurt when things hit you, and it's very easy to die, so put some points into Vigor, and then start leveling out with Faith and Mind, and then depending on the weapon you choose to land with, I definitely ditch the spear as soon as possible, but depending on what your main weapon will be, you can put some points into Strength and Dexterity, just so you can level that out. For gear, this is where the Prophet really comes together, so we're going to go through a ton of things here. So firstly, go to Stormvale Castle, see Margaret, the boss there, you don't have to kill them, just see them, just say, you know, hey, how's it going, and then die, do whatever. After this, you will unlock the Round Table Hold, where you can start buying incantations. I would recommend to go here and talk to the guy that looks like a Prophet, and you can buy the incantations. Flamesling is the one you want to buy immediately, and then you've got other options there, but Flamesling is the primary one you want to get. You can also take a pit stop at the other vendor here as well, and they will sell you a shield that has a 100% physical negation, which is better than that initial rickety shield you get, so you can stop taking that chip damage with your shield. From here, you want to farm runes and either buy better armor or just get lucky with drops. You know, things that you kill will actually drop armor, so you can either do that or just farm it and replace the profit set you've got. Once you feel confident, you want to head down to the Weeping Peninsula in the south, and this is where the Prophet's money is made. The Weeping Peninsula is filled with incantations to collect and upgrades for the Prophet and generally other classes as well, so it's well worth going there regardless, but this is a great place to go for the Prophet. There is the Thunderbolt incantation, the Poison Mist incantation hidden around. There's others as well, but the main one you want to pick up is the Flame of Frenzy, which is found here. This will become a well worth spell in your arsenal to keep using so you can deal AoE damage when you do group up a lot of enemies. You should also take a quick pit stop to the Oridus Rise and you'll get your first memory stone here so you can increase the amount of total spells you can carry. I won't spoil how to solve the puzzle for you but it is relatively easy. You can look it up if you do need to go. You can also head to the Tombwood Ruins which is in the Weeping Peninsula as well. Here you'll find the Winged Scythe which is a Faith Scythe but you need a lot of strength and dexterity to wield it so it's a bit more of a mid to late game weapon but it is a really valuable weapon for a Faith build which is kind of what we're going for here. Once you get through the initial struggles with the Prophet this class is very very strong and we haven't even talked about the dragon spells which you can get when you kill a dragon you get a heart you can take that to dragon island and you can get the dragon incantations from there which is very strong on its own right but they do have a high fp cost also, don't forget to upgrade your seal. You won't get another seal until around Stormvale Castle when you're going through there. So upgrade your initial finger seal. It'll just increase the damage you do overall. Let's start with character creation. Now, as a hero, you start at soul level seven. You have the highest starting strength, which is very important for this class, as well as an endurance of 12 and vigor of 14. So we have a high starting health with vigor and a pretty decent stamina and equip load with endurance. Your starting gear for the hero is the battle axe, the large leather shield, which we will need to replace if you want to stick around with the shield, as well as the champion armor set. The champion armor set doesn't give the best resistances. It's okay, but you will want to also replace that as soon as possible. Your keepsake is always the golden seed and flasks you should put them all into health we're not really using fp in this build other than ashes of war maybe one in fp if you really want to use acid war but just health it all the way in my opinion how to play as the hero is really this is a great starter class for any strength build this class is moderately beginner friendly so you could pick this up as your very first class because it does have such a solid melee stat spread but your armor is pretty weak so you will need to keep your wits about you in the early stages the hero's basic axe and shield combo is a solid base to start from. You have plenty of stamina to block attacks as well as follow up with guard counters by blocking an attack and then heavy attacking afterwards. You can put enemies off their balance here and follow up with critical hits. The Ash of War on the Axe, if you're planning to two-hand the Axe, is just okay. It locks you in place while you're performing the strike animation, so you can take hits with this very easy, so just be cautious with that. The benefit to this class, however, is that it's one of the best starting bases for a two-handed weapon build. So some of the bigger weapons in the game, like the great swords, the Halberds, or hammers, you can pick your favorite of them and just really smack enemies around with this build. The battle axe that you do start out with is solid though. Don't sleep on the little fella. The axe will do you no wrong. As long as you replace that shield with a shield that has a 100% physical negation, you will be completely fine just going axe and shield. As you don't have any magic or spells, you're really only using the little FP you have to cast Ashes of War. The basic Ash of War, as we said, is just okay. So you will want to replace this and we'll talk about that a little bit in the gear section. However, if you go something like the Lord Sworn Greatsword, which you can get super early on, it 
does have a great Ashes of War and that upward slash that you do have. For your attributes, your main focus is going to be on your strength as we're going to be using strength scaling weapons. So you want to have a high strength to deal maximum amounts of damage. Endurance and Vigor will be your secondary stats. Endurance to increase your equip load because we are going to be using heavier weapons and heavier armor as well as Vigor to increase your overall health. I would also put some minor points into dexterity for some of the weapons you need to equip. For example, the great sword that we mentioned earlier needs 10 dexterity and you start with nine. Your gear to get for the hero comes down to really two main priorities. The first is replacing your armor and the second is getting better Ashes of War. You can buy armor at many of the vendors for a few ruins, but I'd recommend to grab the knight set from the vendor at the round table hold. This armor is heavy. It has really good resistances for early in the game. And because we have a high endurance, we have a higher equip load and we'll be able to handle this heavy load sounds weird we'll be able to handle this heavy load much easier than some of the other classes because we do have that extra endurance and you can avoid fat rolling by keeping your equipped load under 70 percent the ash of war vendor is next up and they can be found at the war master shack here you can buy ashes of war for all the different melee weapons and you will find ashes of war out throughout the world while you're exploring as well but this is just a good place to start to buy some and test them out and see what works for you grab the lord's worn great sword at the gate front ruins if you're going to the two-handed route you could also grab the battle hammer which is dropped by the boss at the end of the Murkwater Catacombs, which is very easy to get to. It's just near the lake with the dragon in Limgrave. Also find other weapons. The benefit with the hero and builds like this is any of the big heavier weapons that you find, you're going to be able to test them out by just putting a couple of points in dexterity or even just by having the extra strength that you do have. So you're gonna be able to try out some of the weapons that most of the other classes are locked out of. So it's one of the benefits of picking up the hero. Let's start with character creation. Now, as a samurai, you start out at soul level nine and your main stat is dexterity, which is because we're going to be using the bow as well as the Uchi Katana as our starting weapons. You do have a really good amount of endurance for your stamina as well as vigor, so you have a bit of health and your strength at 12 is pretty solid as a starting kit. Your starting gear is just very solid across the board. You get the Uchi Katana, a long bow. It's the only class that starts out with a weapon like the Uchi Katana that has bleed on it and some relatively average armor that actually looks really sick though. I think the looks is more important here than the resistances, let's be real. Now, we're always going to pick the golden seed as our keepsake, and for your flask, we're practically putting all of our flasks in health, though I really think maybe one in FP because we're going to be using a lot of Ashes of War for this build, so having a little bit of FP recovery is actually well worth having. How to play this class. This is a really solid class, and it's recommended for new players and veterans alike because of how versatile and just generally fun it is. With the bow, you'll pretty much use it to thin out enemies for firing arrows using that mighty shot Ash of War, which does tons of damage in a one shot a lot of enemies in the game. And then once they get close to you, you're going to kill them with the Uchi Katana using that unsheathed Ash of War, which is extremely solid. It has such a quick attack and it does a tons of super armor damage or poise damage, whatever it's actually called, where you can knock them down and critical hit them. It's really good to use. So you're going to be using a lot of those Ash of War between the mighty shot and the unsheathed as well, switching between the longbow and the Uchi Katana for short and long range. And you will need to craft your own arrows. In the beginning, the animal bone arrows is really all you can get until you do find more recipe books. You can buy them from vendors or find them throughout the world, but Kale at the Church of Ella will sell you the cookbooks that you need to be able to make the bone arrows. Just go farm some of the goats at Storm Hill. There's tons of them up there. They'll drop the bones and you'll be able to make yourself some arrows so you won't run out. But as you develop, you can actually get better arrows to be able to use. But basically the general flow of combat with this build is you'll start at range, you'll do a little bit of damage, do some mighty shots, try and thin out the herd. Then when they come to you, you'll just switch to the Uchi Katana and slice and dice them. You can use the jump attack here to close distance faster than just waiting for them to come to you. It will do a decent amount of damage and it's worth doing. I don't really use the shield with this build at all. I pretty much just stick with the bow and the Uchi Katana. It's worth noting that you can two hand either the bow or the sword without having to switch what hands they're in. You just hold either triangle or Y on the controller and then press LB or RB for whichever weapon and it'll switch to being the two handed so you can use the Ashes of War. It's well worth doing because then you can switch between so if you're in range, you can quickly mighty shot and then switch back to Uchi Katana and clean up whatever's left. The, really, the strength of this build is just how good the starting gear is. The longbow and the Uchi Katana are both really solid, especially the Uchi Katana that does blood loss bleed up. And you, they've got a really good bow that has decent range and you can just get better arrows as you progress and keep leveling both of these weapons up. For bosses, I mostly just use the spirit summons and then deal damage from range. I'll occasionally get in close range and do some unsheath attacks and deal some damage in the melee range, but you've just got to be be careful of your dodges if you are jumping into melee because we don't have high resistances here. Let's talk attributes and your main attribute is going to 
HP Dexterity. This is going to benefit your Uchi Katana as well as your Longbow. And then we're going to put points into Endurance for the extra stamina, as well as Equip Load so we can put some heavier armor on without fat rolling and Vigor to get ourselves a little bit more health because we're not really using a shield. You will take some chip damage or some damage here and there, so it's good to have a high amount of health just to keep yourself topped up and alive. For gear to get, there isn't really much, but there's kind of two things you need to think about. The first is the Arrows Reach Talisman above Stormgate. So at the Gatefront Ruins, that gate, if you actually go up there, go around Storm Hill and go up there, there is the Arrows Reach Talisman, which will increase your bow's effectiveness range. And the next is really just to replace your armor. I know it looks sick, but it doesn't have that high of resistances, especially for a melee class. And if we're not using a shield with this build, you could use a shield, but if we're not using a shield with this build, then you want to have some really decent armor with good resistances so that if you do take a hit, you're not going to die. And really, you can just farm armor from enemies. Most enemies will drop something, or you could buy something from a vendor, or even wait to get to the round table. There's some good knight armor there at the round table hold, but, but there's plenty of armor around. I don't think you need to like hunt for a specific set. You just got to keep in mind that you will need to replace it. One of the best things about this build really is that you don't need to replace your weapons like at all. Like you've got a longbow and the Uchi Katana. Both are really solid. You should be upgrading these weapons. Go down to the Limgrave tunnels and farm some smithing stones so you can upgrade them. If you do want a weapon option, you could go the twin blade, which can be found at the Dragon Burnt Ruins. You can jump down here. Just make sure that you are going in the right tunnel. There is one tunnel that contains rats. That is the wrong tunnel. Turn around. It's a trap. Please believe me. But go down the right tunnel, get the twin blade there. And the twin blade is a really good weapon, but I think the Uji Katana and the bow are just perfect starting weapons. You do tons of damage just right out the gate with this build. The samurai is a really solid starting class. We'll start with character creation. Now, as a warrior, you start out at soul level eight. Your primary start here is dexterity. You start out with the highest dexterity. So if you're looking to make a dex build, this is the best class to start with, more or less. There are some other options. We do have a very low vigor, which is a bad thing because we will take damage with this build with not really using a shield or blocking ever. And we also have a little bit of endurance, but again, also low. Pretty much all of our points go into dexterity here. And we do start out at soul level eight. So a little bit lower level than some of the other classes. The starting gear for the warrior is the two scimitars you also get the wooden shield but you can just throw that in the bin like we're never going to use that just just get rid of it who cares and the blue cloth armor or warrior set which is okay it's pretty light it gives some okay resistances but i would be recommending to replace this as soon as possible for your flasks everything goes into health and obviously start out with the keepsake golden seed now how to play the warrior is it's the only starting class that begins with two weapons in this way when you're equipping two weapons of the same type you get an extra attack on your l1 which will use both of the the weapons at the same time so you get extra attack animations or combos with these weapons it actually deals more damage than the typical r1 so you want to be using this very regularly i wouldn't recommend this class for completely new players as it is a bit of a higher learning curve because you're not really going to be doing a whole lot of blocking i mean you can't block if you're wielding the two weapons you are instead getting those extra attacks you're also going to have to dodge a lot learn enemy attacks and avoid that damage rather than actually blocking it or getting rid of it in some other way for the most part the general flow of combat for you is using the jump attack to close distance and using that L1 attack on the jump. So you use both of your weapons, deal damage, and then move your way back out. Use the jump attack, move around the enemy. Don't just stand in front of them, get some backstabs, play around with them, and then use these attacks freely. I would also recommend to grab a bow or some other ranged weapon like the Krukrai, a way to pull enemies to you. They're gonna be areas where there's lots of enemies in a space and you don't wanna aggro them all at once in a build like this where we don't actually have a whole lot of health and we don't really block at all. So you wanna have a way to pull enemies to you to avoid taking a whole pack at once and the ash of war you start out with on both of the scimitars the spinning slash is very slow and i would recommend to replace this as soon as possible i like storm blade because storm blade gives you a little bit of ranged so you can damage from distance and it's actually much faster than spinning slash and spinning slash is kind of useless when you can do so much more damage just by pressing l1 with both of the weapons your attributes for this build primarily are going to be dexterity and then you want to pump some points into vigor to increase your health and endurance so you can have more stamina for those rolls and dealing damage back at enemies that you may use. You may want to put a couple of points into strength if you're going to switch out from the scimitars to something that's a bit heavier, but for the most part, scimitars will get you by. I'll give you some other options when we get into this next section about gear, which we may as well start right now. You can buy a bow from the vendor along the beach near the coastal cave. They will give you a short bow. They've also sell some arrows, but you can craft your own arrows with using bone arrows, but this is where you can get a bow pretty much straight off the bat for 600 ruins. You should absolutely look for better armor, or you can even just purchase better armor at the castle, Morn, Rampart, 
cards, there is a vendor here that will sell you scale armor, which has similar weight to the starting warrior armor, but has much better physical negation on its armor pieces. So you could pick up the armor here and just make sure you stay in that medium load. So you've got the normal roll rather than the fat roll. The Ash of War vendor where you can buy the Stormblade or even other Ash of Wars is at the Warmaster Shack. It's a little bit past the gate front. So go up there and buy the Stormblade when you've got some ruins to spare. It's probably not necessary to grab it straight away, but it's well worth going up there and grabbing it once you've got runes to spare. And if you don't really like the scimitars, you can get the twin blade, which is a really, really good weapon early in game. You have the stats to equip this pretty much straight out the gate. You can use this as a one or a two handed weapon and it has a great attack move set either way. And it's a great option. If you don't like the scimitars, you just want to go like a one handed route, maybe have a shield or even just two hand the twin blade, great option to have. The downside to the scimitars is that you're going to have to upgrade them separately at the smithing table because you're using two weapons. You're going to have to smith them both separately. So keep that in mind when you are upgrading your weapons. Let's start off with character creation as the bandit. Now you start out at soul level five, which is severely lower than a lot of the other classes. Your highest stat for some strange reason is arcane. Next is dexterity. And then you've got a pretty average vigor and mine. You start out with the great knife, which is a very short range weapon that doesn't do tons of damage. I guess the main weapon you start with is the short bow, which we'll talk about in a little bit. You get the buckler and a couple of bandit pieces, which we're gonna look to replace in a little bit. Your keepsake should always be the golden seed. And when you are putting your points into flask. You want to put most of your points into health, but I would put maybe one flask into FP for Ashes of War like Barrage and Mighty Shot when we're talking about how this archer build comes together. So how you play this build really is I've turned the bandit into this pure archer class. And the sad thing about the bandit is it's a hard to get going in really any direction whether you even don't want to go the archer way. You have such low stats across the board and you can't wield a lot of the weapons that a lot of the other classes can. So from melee perspective, you can't really get going. And as an archer perspective, you're going to have a tough time really getting going in that direction because of you're not going to have a whole lot of arrows you're going to need to craft them you also need to level yourself up as well as the bow before it actually does decent amount of damage but essentially once you get a long bow you start upgrading the short bow you'll be able to switch between short and long depending on whether you want to do more damage at a slower rate with the long bow at longer range or quick damage at a short range with the short bow basically in most boss fights you're probably going to use the short bow but essentially the flow to combat is you'll pick off enemies with the long longbow from range using the mighty shot ash of war and deal as much damage to them as you can once they start getting close to you you'll switch out to the short bow and deal like chip damage to them with the short bow at much more of a faster rate you want to be keeping the distance away from enemies so rolling out of the way jumping back and shooting at the same because you can jump and shoot in the same animation you want to do that quickly by jumping backwards and keep shooting keep that distance you can also have two arrows bound so one to r1 and one to r2 and you should absolutely make leverage of this to use different types of arrows so say a fire arrow and a standard arrow or poison or bleed or whatever it may be you should absolutely be using this it's one of the strengths of an archer build is that you can have different arrow types that do different kinds of damage so if enemies have certain resistances or weaknesses to certain damage types you can then leverage that by having these arrows but the key thing here is you're going to have to spend a lot of time crafting arrows or buying them you can buy standard arrows from practically every vendor they're relatively cheap if you want to get into some of the elemental types of arrows you will have to craft them but i mean the bone arrows aren't too hard to make to get the bones you really just need to farm some of the goats and various animals you see around you'll be able to craft a fair amount pretty quickly as long as you're spending that time it's just worth noting that this build takes a little bit to come together you're gonna need to farm the runes you're gonna need to farm the crafting materials to make arrows but eventually it does become a bit of fun for your attributes your main attribute really is going to be dexterity in the long run but i think putting points into endurance and vigor early on is important because we do have such a low health and also the bandit armor is very weak so when you take damage you're probably going to die so increasing your vigor early is important as well as your endurance because using the bow whether it's a long or a short bow does require a lot of stamina because we're going to be jumping and attacking and rolling and moving around a lot you will need a lot of stamina to be able to keep yourself going and not get stuck having no stamina and then get one shot by bosses or any other enemies but then in the long run you know your dexterity you're going to put a lot of points into but initially because we start at such a low level vigor and endurance are very important 
gear to get for this build is really important to come together as a whole. Now, arrows are the most important. So you want to buy the crafting kit and the basic arrow recipes from Kale at the Church of Ella. You can also get the Armorer's Cookbook number two from the merchant southeast of the coastal cave. And this is where you get the firebone arrows so you can do fire damage. If you head towards Summon Water, there's a vendor here that'll sell you the poison arrows. But basically, initially, you really just need the basic bone arrows and the firebone arrows to give you some elemental damage that you can do and then spend any extra runes you have on just buying arrows. The arrows you buy will initially do more damage than the ones that you make yourself. So you want to stock up on these as much as possible, especially for boss fights. If you run out of arrows in a boss fight like I did, you are screwed and you're probably going to die. The, this boss fight in Summer Water was going so well for me and I just ran out of ammo. But anyway, you can grab the longbow from the round table hold once you have unlocked that. Basically, the quickest way to unlock round table hold is lose to Marga, the first boss at Stormvale Castle. After that, you'll get a cutscene, you unlock round table hold and you can buy the longbow from there. And the Arrows Reese Talisman is the last thing I would suggest to get. You can pick this up at Stormgate and it will increase your bow range effectiveness. I would also recommend to replace your banded armor pretty much as soon as possible. You can just find armor around or you could grab the scale armor from the Castle Morn Ramparts. It's also worth noting as well, if you want to stick around with the dagger, the blood dagger, the Reduvia that you get from Bloody Fingers is actually not a bad dagger that you can just equip pretty much straight away because you do have a high arcane, but really we're ditching the knives here for the purpose of the bows. We will start out with the Frost Mage. Now, the Frost Mage builds play similarly to another build on this list, but essentially you will use the Dark Moon Greatsword Ash of War, the Moonlight Greatsword, and this skill will imbue your Greatsword with Frost and add a unique effect to your heavy attack, which will throw a Frost Wave in front of you. You can combine this with the Great Baked Phallics to deal stagger damage to enemies, so you can often stagger them to follow up with critical hits. And this build also uses the Snow Witch Hat, which will increase your cold sorceries. And the build focuses on using the these eye sorceries and this sword as kind of your main crux for this build. The main cold sorceries you'll use is Anjula's Moonblade, which is like a souped up version of the Carrion Greatsword, which will do a frost wave attack in front of you. Zamo Ice Storm is pretty cool. I like this. It's like an AOE attack that will deal frost bite damage and just frost damage to enemies in a circle around you. You can actually charge this up so the effect lasts longer and deals more damage. Glintstone Iceberg is like an ice version of the great Glintstone Shards that you can use. This has a shorter range but it does do the ice damage on top of it so that's why it's beneficial for this build because you get that extra cold damage bonus and when you combine all these things with the moon like greatsword you are going to be triggering the frostbite effect on most enemies pretty regularly unless they die faster because as you do level up this build and because of all the bonuses you have you will kill things mostly pretty quickly but the main stat for this build is intelligence you're going to want to at least have 60 intelligence and then move into mind vigor endurance and you're going to need a little bit of strength and dex just to be able to wield the dark moon greatsword so be mindful to make sure you've got enough of that but the main focus here is on intelligence for your other weapons i'm using the carrion regal scepter here but you can use a different scepter if you choose to i just like the carrion regal scepter we don't need a shield in this build you're really just using the dark moon greatsword in one hand and then the carrion scepter in the other the snow witch hat which you already mentioned and then you can just wear the rest of the snow witch armor however it's probably better to put some better armor on because you will spend some time in melee range or in that kind of mid-range just so you can actually land the moonlight greatswords like heavy attack like wave ability so you will take some damage here and the snow witch set has like zero resistances so you will die very quickly which is something that i learned when just wearing the full set for your talismans you want to rock the godfrey icon to enhance your charge spells and skills because we do have some charged spells and skills in this build the magic scorpion charm will raise your magic damage but it does lower your damage negation another reason why you should put some armor on the shard of alexander greatly boosts the attack power of your skills so well worth using this because of the moonlight greatsword and carrion filigree crest so that when you do cast those skills or the ash of war from your sword you don't use all of your fp and you've still got plenty left over for your spells you don't just have to stick to this ice theme with this build you can use any of the other spells because you've got such a high intelligence really you could use any of the spells that you choose i am using rani's dark moon as well because it does launch that cold effect to enemies so you get a little bit of that extra damage it also increases the susceptibility to taking damage from that magic effects as well so there's a lot of benefits to this build and freedom of how you want to play it whether you want to go a bit more into the magic line and just to simply use the dark moon sword occasionally but i think you want to find that balance between the two and i do like this combination the next build is the sorcerer the sorcerer focuses simply on range spell casting and avoiding melee range entirely. This build uses the Jellyfish Shields Ash of War Contagious Fury, which boosts all damage by 20% for 30 seconds. You can combine this with the Terra Magicka, which will further increase your ranged spell damage and then use something like Comet Azua to just melt through enemies. But this build is all 
about finding the spells that work for you and just using them realistically. You will use the Ash of War on the shield to give yourself extra damage and then just cast any of the main spells. Your primary spell is probably going to be the Great Glintstone Shard. It's a cheap cast. It is quick as well and it does solid damage. So it's kind of your staple spell. I'm a big fan of Rock Sling. It will stagger enemies regularly. It keeps enemies away from you. You cast those three rocks at them. Loretta's Great Bow is a great ranged option as well or Loretta's Mastery. Comet Azua to shoot that beam directly out in front of you. It'll shred through enemies if you stay in the beam and you can then use the Terra Magicka as well to boost that effect even more. And you can really only use that on slow moving or the larger targets, but it's well worth using just to melt through those bosses. Your primary stat for this build is again going to be intelligence and then your secondary stats being mind, vigor, and endurance. You don't really need any dexterity for this build. You will need a little bit of strength to hit that requirement in order to be able to use the jellyfish shield, which is 20. For your armor, I would wear the queen's crescent crown to increase your intelligence by a little bit to increase your overall damage. Your armor, otherwise, really up to you. You could just rock any kind of robes or anything because you will be mostly in range, but you could just rock some armor anyway and just medium roll. That is entirely up to you. Weapon-wise, I am again using the Carrion Regal Scepter. It is my favorite scepter. We're going to use it in all of these builds, to be honest. But you could switch out to Lucent's Glintstone Staff, which will enhance the powers of your sorceries, but increase the additional FP cost. So they'll cost more. And because this build, you can focus a bit more on mind and having such a high FP cost, you can really outweigh that effect. But that's entirely up to you as to which option you want to go, though I just prefer to use the Carrion Regal Scepter. And in terms of your talismans, we're sticking with Godfrey Icon again to enhance your charge spells and skills. Magic Scorpion Charm again to to increase your magic damage. We're also going with the Radagon icon this time to shorten the spell casting time because you are entirely going to be casting all of the time. Any reduction in that casting time is beneficial to you and the Stargazer heirloom to increase your intelligence even more. Now, as mentioned, there is tons of flexibility in the spell usage here. Now, if you want to stick with this Sorcerer, the ranged option, then sticking with these spells that we've mentioned, the Great Glintstone Shard, Rock Sling, the Redder's Mastery, Comet Azua, those kind of spells will absolutely see you with great success. But then you can just chuck some armor on like I have in this footage and to basically make it an enchanted knight build and run with like the carrion slicer and carrion piercer and then you can kind of mix those two builds together you can still do all that range stuff you can do that close range stuff without virtually any changes to this build really just picking up those extra skills there's a lot of flexibility in the sorcerer and just running like a pure sorcerer intelligence build like we are here my personal favorite intelligence build and the build how i finished the game for the first time fun fact is the moon veil samurai now this build centers around the strength of the moon veil katana's ash of war the transient moonlight this skill is exactly the same as the Unsheathed Ash War, except it has a magic wave effect that comes out of it from whether you do the light attack version, which is like a horizontal wave, or the heavy attack version, which is a vertical wave. The vertical wave has more stagger potential and you'll probably use this most of the time. You can combine this with the Great Blade Phalanx in the same way that you can with the Frost Mage build to deal stagger damage to follow up with critical hits. Though this build, it is well worth doing and it is much more effective than in the Frost Mage build because of the tremendous damage that this attack does on its own, plus the stagger damage. They have nerfed it a smidge but it's still like really really good the carrion regal scepter is our scepter again so we don't really need to talk about that again and for your primary stats here it's going to be intelligence and dexterity intelligence leaning first so you can get that 60 requirement to use the carrion regal scepter and then dexterity because the moon veil katana stacks evenly with intelligence and dexterity eventually you're going to get diminishing returns from putting points into intelligence so you want to put some of those points into dexterity and then mind vigor and endurance you want to put those pretty much evenly with a slight priority into vigor because you will be in melee range for most of this build so that extra bit of health will be absolutely beneficial we're not using a shield at all in this build though you can i did use a shield during my original playthrough for bits and pieces but mostly you'll just be dual wielding the sword and a staff now your armor here you can rock the queen's crescent crown again to increase your intelligence however you can honestly just wear whatever you like for this build anything that allows you to, to medium roll i'm wearing the white reed set here just because i wanted to look like a samurai in this footage but realistically you can wear anything you like talismans here it's all based around that attack so carrion filigree crest to lower the FP cost of the skill itself. Magic scorpion charm to increase your magic damage. We're also using shard of Alexander to greatly boost the attack power of the skill itself, and the green turtle talisman to increase the stamina recovery speed. The only real spell you'll use in this build is the great blade phalanx for that stagger potential that comes with it. But you can combine it with anything else, right? You can use the glintstone shard, Loretta's great bow, anything like that, just to kind of combine this build with other things because of the flexibility that it does have. But realistically you want to just focus on the moon veil katana as it is such a strong attack the ash of war on it and you want to combine it with that stagger potential from the great blade phalanx realistically that's all you really need 
First, we'll start out with what I'm going to call the Black Blade. The Black Blade is about buffing your damage with incantations like Black Flame Blade or Blood Flame Blade to buff their Naga Kiba. You don't have to use a Naga Kiba, you can use some other weapon as long as it doesn't already have an additional effect like magic or fire damage, something like that, so that you can buff it with these incantations. Blood Flame Blade will increase your blood loss buildup with the Naga Kiba so you can trigger that status effect more often. And the Lord of Blood's Exaltation Talisman will allow us to increase your damage even further when that blood loss effect is applied. Same goes for the white mask, which we're wearing here as well. We can also combo this with something like Seppuku so that you can trigger blood loss on yourself to trigger this status effect. However, I originally was doing this, but decided to switch to double slash because I preferred to have an Ash of War that was a bit more offensive orientated as it's very easy to get that blood loss effect on enemies. And I wanted to have something a bit more aggressive rather than just the ability to stab myself when I'm just running the one weapon. You can also run Flame Grant Me Strength to increase your physical damage dealt. Golden Vow as well to increase your damage dealt. There's also the Black Flames Protection to keep with that black kind of theme that we're going with here as well if you wanted to go that route and scouring Black Flame which will do an AoE attack in front of you and deal that Black Flame damage to enemies as well as Black Flame Ritual. So lots of Black Flame skills and stuff in this build really. Essentially the goal of this build is to buff yourself and your single weapon, the Naga Keeper being the Katana with the longest reach as much as possible and then just melting down enemies with this build. It's kind of the main goal here really and it's a fun build to play if you just want to focus on a single katana setup and because of the faith that you do have for this build as well you can then you know spec into other incantations if you don't like the incantations that we're using here you can go into really any kind of direction here really. The primary stats for this build is dexterity obviously and faith you will need a bit of faith for using all of these different spells at least around the 42 marks that you can use all of the different spells that we are using. I'm using the Naga Kiba as mentioned and the God Slayer's Seal. You can use a shield with this build in your offhand if you really wanted to, however I wouldn't recommend it. You may as well just keep the seal in your second hand and when you're not using any incantations you can two hand the Naga Kiba. For talismans I'm using the green tonal talisman to increase my stamina recovery. The Lord of Blood's Exaltation, so blood loss in vicinity increases my attack power. The Rotten Winged Sword Insignia to increase my damage on consecutive hits. And I'm using the Great Shield Talisman as well to improve my physical damage negation however you can switch this out to anything you like if you do prefer to use something else however because this build doesn't really have any defenses having that extra physical negation does help in the long run next up we have the poison samurai now i made a whole video on the poison samurai so go check that out if you want to really get into the nitty gritty of this build but this build focuses on dual wielding weapons to apply status effects namely the poison status effect as well as blood loss simultaneously when poison is triggered you get that damage increase from the kindred of rot exaltation and the mushroom hat to increase your attack power as well as Lord of Blood's Exaltation for when you trigger Blood Loss to increase your attack power even further. And we can trigger these effects with some of the Ash of Wars that we're using. And you've also got the Rotten Wind Insignia to increase your damage even further just for dealing different attacks. So really this build is all about buffing your attack power and triggering status effects. Now for this build, I use dual Uchi Katanas. However, you can use the Scavenger Curse Swords if you do have both of them like in New Game Plus because you can get one per playthrough. So you can then level these up and use these instead. However, I'm personally using the Uchi Katanas, but you can and go that other route. Now, for the Ashes of War for this build, the Seppuku skill is perfect to use here because you can then stab yourself, get that blood loss increase to yourself, as well as the damage increase you get from just using the skill itself. And the other skill is the Poison Moth Flight on the main weapon. You want to have this on your main weapon because this is the one you'll use in combat mostly. Now, if the target doesn't already have poison applied, it will add to their poison buildup and do damage. If they do have poison, it will like explode the poison and deal damage damage to them like a kind of like as if it's triggering blood loss but it's triggering like the poison and then you can actually apply poison to them again after that so you can just keep reapplying the poison status in that way and just keep increasing your attack power and cycling through the different like status effects like exploding on the target to just deal heaps of damage it works really really well and i really like this build your main stat for this build is just dexterity however you should put some points into strength just to help with your scaling so you can get that extra bit of juice out of your damage your secondary stats really here is vigor and endurance you don't necessarily Necessarily need any mind for this build but you will need some vigor and endurance especially endurance because you're just going to be swinging for days now as mentioned i'm using dual uchi katanas however you can switch to like a naga kiba if you don't have two uchi katanas or you can use the scavenger curse sword the main focus is having two weapons that have blood loss build up on them already and then when you apply the two ashes of war seppuku and poison moth flight you can set them both to poison so that they both do poison build up and blood loss build up so you get both of those effects applying for my armor you can just wear whatever but i am wearing the mushroom hat
hat. So every time poison is applied, it increases your attack power further. You absolutely need to wear this crazy hat. For your talismans, Lord of Blood's Exaltation and the Kindred of Rot Exaltation will increase your damage for blood loss and poison buildup respectively. The Rotten Winged Sword Insignia to greatly raise attack power with sick defensive attack. I also am a fan of Godswing Swaddling Cloth for this build. So successive attacks restore HP. However, if you do have Millicent's Prosthetic, which will boost your dexterity and raises the attack power with successive attacks as well, use that instead. However, you have to do Millicent's quest line in a certain way to get it, and I did it the other way. The last build on this list is something you probably have guessed already, and it revolves around a particular katana that everybody loves, and that is the Rivers of Blood katana. This is like a samurai build that simply focuses on how powerful the Ash of War on this weapon is, the corpse pilot. This is like you're going to be your primary attack. Now, the Rivers of Blood katana itself does physical and fire damage as well as blood loss buildup, so it does all of those statuses, which is just fantastic. We're going to wear the white mask here to increase your damage overall when you do have blood loss applied. And this build also uses Flame Grant Me Strength to increase your physical and fire damage, which are the two main types of damage you do here. So really, you're just focusing simply on that Ash of War and buffing it as many ways as possible. Now, you can dual wield Rivers of Blood Katanas in New Game Plus like I'm doing in this footage, but you don't have to. You could just rock one and two hand it, or even just have like an Uchi Katana or the Nagakira or something in your offhand if you wanted to go the dual wielding route. But realistically, just having that Rivers of Blood Katana, leveling it up and using that as your primary weapon is the main focus of this build and it just melts enemies. It can be a little bit tricky sometimes to time it right to get it off, but you will figure out the timing. You kind of have to start the attack animations before they get to you and hope that you have enough poise to kind of go through their attacks. And in some cases, if they block or you do get staggered, that does ruin your flow and it makes it a little bit hard with this build. You might have to actually use just some of the generic attacks, but if as long as you can just focus on using the corpse pilot, you are going to see great success. Your stats for this build are dexterity and arcane you want to level them almost simultaneously because of how well the rivers of blood stacks with dexterity and arcane together your secondary stats are vigor endurance and mind you probably want to have more vigor and endurance but you will need a bit of mind because we're using cause pilot so much you want to have a little bit of that you will also need 15 faith so you can use flame grant me strength for this build but that's a pretty small investment when you're like at the end of the game so we are using the rivers of blood weapon as mentioned and i'm using the dragon communal seal because it stacks with arcane and has very very low actual requirements in order to use so we are using that any armor that allows you to medium roll is really important for this build and having a decent amount of poise as well so you can take some hits while using corpse pilot so make sure you get that poise above the 56 ish mark for your talismans we're using the lord of blood exaltation and the rotten winged sword insignia again both of these are great carry and filigine crest will reduce the cost of corpse pilot every time you use it and shard of alexander to maximize the damage output for corpse pilot start out with the sacred shield now this build focuses on mogwin's sacred spear and the unique blood boon ritual skill this weapon does physical and fire damage and blood loss build up so all the things that we really like with arcane builds the white mask will give you extra damage when blood loss is around you so we're also wearing that as well as having a little bit of investment into faith mainly so that we can have flame grant me strength because that buffs physical and fire damage which are the two main types of damage that this weapon does your primary attack will be just holding your shield up and poking with the spear because it's a piercing weapon you can hold your guard while poking with the spear now stand back i gotta practice my stabbing <laughs> So you'll use that pretty much most of the general enemies that you see, especially when you're just fighting one-on-one, -on -one, you'll just keep your shield up and poke away. And then in situations where there's AoE or maybe a boss or something, you will use the Blood Boon Ritual for the massive AoE attack that it does, that it causes explosions of blood. You can increase the damage you do with this with Shard of Alexander or even reduce the cost of it with Carry and Filigree and Quest, but there's plenty of flexibility in putting this build together. Your main stats for this build are Arcane and Strength, primarily arcane but you will need a bit of strength so that you can wield the sacred spear as well as wield a great shield which we're using in this build now depending on your great shield that will change i personally am using the icon great shield which will give you a little bit of health back just gradually restoring your health while using it now this shield doesn't have 100 physical damage negation it actually has 95 which is so close to 100 that it's barely noticeable the tiny little bit of chip damage that you do take but because you're constantly getting that health back it actually outweighs some of that chip damage but you can really 
realistically pick any shield as long as it doesn't have a weapon skill on it, which is the key thing because we want our Ash of War to be the Blood Boon Ritual, not whatever our shield's Ash of War is, if that makes sense. So other than that though, the Mogwin Sacred Spear is your primary weapon. You're obviously going to level this up, whatever. And you're going to be using the Dragon Communal Seal because this stacks with Arcane and it does stack with Faith as well, but primarily Arcane is our main scaling and it gives you S Arcane Scaling, so you're going to use this primarily. White Mask, as mentioned, to increase your damage when blood loss is applied. Armor-wise, anything that really allows you to media roll, as well as having a bit of poise. Poise is always valuable with a build like this, as well as keeping your resistances high. For your Talismans, I would be going with the Lord of Blood's Exaltation to increase your damage when there is blood loss around you, because poking with the spear will apply blood loss. You could go with the Fire Scorpion Charm here, but I ended up switching this out for the Green Turtle Talisman for that stamina recovery for when you're holding that shield up so you can get that stamina back more quickly. And I would also go Shard of Alexander so you can increase the damage of the Blood Boon Ritual and the Curved Sword Talisman because when you're holding that shield and you can either poke with it or if you block you can do guard counters and get a lot of damage off with guard counters. I've gone that direction because you can get a lot of stagger with guard counters as well. So there's a few variations that you can make with this build in terms of its shields or what talismans are used but this is the general setup that'll get you going. I've also been running the Bestial Vitality Incantation because it requires no more investment in faith and it gives you more health back just like the shield does so you just get little bits of health back in all kind of encounters. The Dragon Priest is the next build. Now this one was honestly a challenge. I knew I wanted to do something with the dragon incantations because of the dragon communal seal which stacks with arcane and faith and it gives bonuses to the dragon incantations but there isn't a weapon that really fits with like a dragon build because there's no weapon that scales with arcane and faith. There's some that scale with arcane and there's some that scale with faith and then obviously there's weapons that don't scale with either but there isn't anything that fits neatly into this build and because the dragon priest spells or incantations are really slow to get off and they have such a wind up time it just I couldn't find a way that I really wanted to put this build together but I found something that I like and there's some variations that you can do or change depending on how you see fit. So we're using the Antspur Rapier here. Now this has Scarlet Rot buildup on it by default. I've put the Seppuku Ash of War on it, which when you stab yourself, you cause blood loss on yourself and add blood loss to the weapon while increasing your attack power. And I've put this as a poison variant so that the Rapier also applies poison. So after applying Seppuku on yourself, you essentially have three status effects on the weapon alone, being poison, blood loss, and Scarlet Rot. Now the main two here really are the Scarlet Rot and poison because they're the two that I want to focus on mostly for this build. Now I'm using the Mushroom Crown here as a way of further increasing my attack power and because there are Dragon Incantations that apply Poison or even Scarlet Rot with the Exeek's Decay or however you say that, you know what I mean. When you apply that status effect, you'll increase your attack power even more and it's kind of using a similar methodology to like the Poison Samurai build, right? Where you're applying these Poison and effects but instead here we're applying Poison and Scarlet Rot you only get that damage or attack power increase when one of them is applied, not if you have both applied separately, it's just one or the other, but you still get that damage increase, right? So really what I'm focusing on here is using the dragon incantations as their slow wind up times, their big damage dealers that they are, using Golden Vow to buff them a little bit more, and then using the Ansper Rapier just against general trash mobs, because realistically there's no point in using the dragon incantations on trash mobs. They take so long to use and to wind up, and it's just kind of a waste of your FP, because they are so FB hungry, but I'm basically using it for that method. Now, because they are so slow as well, combining it with the Ansper Rapier allows you to get attacks off quicker because that weapon has such a fast attack speed just with the poke. I'm also using a shield here so that I can hold the shield up and do little pokes behind the shield, you know, that kind of stuff that I like. So there's a lot of flexibility here. You could go even further into the faith and into the dragon incantations and go down that line or even go around the status effects that we're kind of tinkering with here. But this is what I've decided. Now I did try like the ripple blade because it just purely stacks with arcane and then we just could focus on arcane and faith and the ripple blade does do more damage but I just don't like the move combos for it and it just doesn't feel like it fits so that's why we've gone with this direction. Now our stats here are arcane and faith primarily. You don't need heaps of faith like around the 36 mark just so you can make sure you can use all the dragon incantations is fine and then maximize your arcane. If you really want to focus on the rapier you will want to put more points into dexterity that I have here but I've essentially just put enough points into dexterity so that the weapon is 
viable as we're not necessarily focusing on the damage the weapon does, but the effects that it applies, the status effects. So you want to focus on applying the status effects, not just using it as a physical weapon to apply damage, if that makes sense. The Dragon Communal Seal is what we're using here to increase the damage of our dragon spells, armor-wise, the Mushroom Crown, and then anything else that really gives you a lot of resistances, as well as giving you high amounts of poise, because you will take damage while trying to get these dragon spells off. I'm using the Lord of Rot's Exaltation here to increase my damage even further when there is poison or rot in the area. I was originally using Lord of Blood's Exaltation, but you can switch here to the Assassin's Cerulean Dagger, so when you do critical hits, you can restore your FP back, so you can get some without having to use your flask to get some back. Faithful's Canvas Talisman to increase the potency of your incantations, because we are casting a lot. And I'm also using the Dragon Quest Great Shield Talisman here to increase my physical damage negation, because you're going to take a lot of damage with this build, so any way you can mitigate that is highly valuable. Realistically, for your spells here or your incantations, all of the dragon things that you can use, Dragon Claw, Dragon Maw, Rotten Breath, Exix, Decay, all of these are fine and fit within this build, but really you want to focus on the Decay Breath and the Rotten Breath so that you can apply Scarlet Rot and Poison to the enemies. The last build is the Pole Dancer. I couldn't really think of a good name for it, so we're going to go with that. And I've already done a Rivers of Blood build in my Dexterity video, so go watch that if you're looking for something like that. But I wanted to do an Arcane Dex variant, and this is what I've landed on for this video. So what we're focusing on here is using Eleonora's Pole Blade and the unique effect that that weapon has has with its skill being the Blood Blade Dance. This is going to be your primary attack and it does physical and fire damage as well as blood loss bleed up. Essentially think of this as a twin blade variant on a Rivers of Blood build. Its functions very similar. So the white mask we're wearing to increase damage when blood loss is applied. You can also add 15 faith to this build to use flame carry strength to increase your physical and fire damage. I am dual wielding with a second twin blade in my offhand with seppuku applied here so that I can apply blood loss on myself as well as dual wield these weapons for like power stancing with them. You can just two hand Eleonora's pole blade in encounters as well as the twin blades do have such a fast like attack animation that you don't necessarily need to have two but it allows you to have seppuku on that second one and then if you just want to get rid of it you can just two hand the one in your right hand. I'm also using the dragon communal seal here with the flame grant me strength, swarm of flies and the dragon breath just as a couple of spells because we've got that 15 faith so you can use swarm of flies to apply blood loss from range. It's always good to have a ranged option which is why I like having swarm of flies in this build but it's really up to you for your stats here arcane and dex are your primary stats as well as vigor endurance and mind being your secondary as long as you got 15 faith you will be fine there as mentioned eleonora's pole blade is what we're using you can dual wield with a twin blade if you want to as well as the dragon communal seal for your talismans i'm wearing the lord of blood's exaltation to increase my damage when blood loss is around rotten winged sword insignia because of blood dancers ash of war because you do multiple attacks you get that successive attack to increase your attack power you can also get multiple of these off without like kind of taking damage because of the way you kind of leap around you leap forward deal some attacks and leap back then leap forward again you can avoid some attacks just because of the way the hitboxes work which is really nice carrion filigree crest to reduce the cost of the attack and shard of alexander to increase its damage is how this build really fits together We're going to start out with the Paladin. The Paladin is a defense orientated build focusing on guard countering attacks and using holy damage solely with the Code Sword to finish off enemies. The Code Sword has the unblockable blade skill which makes a sweeping attack that cannot be blocked and this weapon is also unique because its standard attacks cannot be bounced off shields like normal armaments. This build uses the Golden Vow to buff your defense and attack power and you've got plenty of other spell options that you can use like Lightning Spear or the Blessing of the Earth tree or really anything else because this build is almost solely based on faith you can use really any incantations that fit with that line guard countering to deal damage in that way and just focusing on keeping this like sword and shield kind of style you could go further into this by using like a great shield to really maximize your defensive potential and use something like the clean rot spear which also scales with faith so that you can always keep your shield up and then poke from behind the shield but we're using this like guard countering sword and shield style and i really like the coated sword and not enough people talk about it it's a really cool weapon so the primary primary stat for this build is faith. You want to maximize your faith because the coded sword only stacks with faith. So the highest faith you go, the better. Vigor, endurance, and mine are your secondary stats for your health, your stamina, as well as your FP for those incantations. We're using the brass shield as mentioned. I'm also wearing the Halog Knight Helm to increase my faith a little bit. And then otherwise your armor can be whatever you like, as long as you can medium roll. Your talismans here are the Sacred Scorpion Charm to increase your holy damage. The Shard of Alexander to increase the damage of your unblockable blade. The 
flux canvas talisman to increase the potency of your incantations and the curved sword talisman to increase your abilities with guard counters so they do more damage. Now we mentioned a couple of spells like the golden vow and the lightning spear and the blessing of the earth tree. Really you can use anything right like if you're playing with friends online you can use a lot of those like health buff spells and really focus on being like the support or you can go really into like the more damage orientated incantations. You've got plenty of flexibility in terms of how you want to play the paladin. Next is the knight and flame swordsman. I couldn't think of a better name for this build so if you've got a better name for it then let me know in the comments down below but this build is a faith and intelligence hybrid using this weapon which is also a faith and intelligence hybrid weapon. You're going to use this weapon's ash of war the knight and flame stance as kind of your primary attack in most scenarios and this skill will either do fire damage or magic damage depending on if you use its heavy or its light attack from the stance. Depending on the boss or the enemy and their resistances to fire or magic damage you want to switch between say the fire scorpion charm to increase your fire damage and the magic scorpion charm to increase your magic damage. So not only do you have the flexibility of dealing magic and fire damage depending on your ash of war because this build uses faith and intelligence you can equip a seal and a staff and alternate between incantations or using spells depending on the scenario that you're in or which ones you like to use most. It's so much flexibility in having both incantations and spells available to you and using the Night and Flame Sword is really the only build where it fits in nicely because the weapon scales with both of these so it's like a perfect combination to mix up your playstyle as you see fit right because you can use dragon spells or any of the other incantations as well as all of the really powerful sorceries once you get deeper down and you've got all of the faith and intelligence in order to be able to use some of the higher level spells and incantations it's just going to be a lot of fun to mix around with your stats for this build will be faith and endurance almost maxed out you want to get these as high as possible and then vigor might and endurance as your secondary skills the sword of night and flame is what we are using as our sword this is a powerful sword even without the ash of war but the ash of war is the main focus and you can use any seal and any staff the god sayer steel is fine or any staff that you can wield is perfect you could put a shield into this build if you wanted to do like a shield like sword and board kind of deal but i think it's better to wield either the seal or the staff in your offhand and then two hand the sword in some scenarios if you do want to for your talismans we're using the godfrey icon to raise the attack power of your charged spells and skills the shard of alexander to increase the damage of your ash of war the carrion filigine crest to reduce the fp cost of the ash of war and then you can alternate between the fire scorpion charm and the magic scorpion charm depending on how you see fit and the dragon crest shield talisman will reduce your physical damage received as we don't really have a huge amount of defenses especially if you want to wear the spell blade set which in terms of armor you could absolutely wear for this build as it will increase the magic damage that the knight and flame sword does from its magic attack it won't work with the fire damage but it will with the magic attack so if you wanted to lean into that more you can wear the spell blade set then use that talisman to help with some of those resistances as the spell blade set has pretty low resistances as a whole for your spells flame grant me strength is perfect to increase your physical and fire damage terra magica should be used so you can buff the magic damage that the weapon does so you got to stand in that one to actually get the buff it's different to like flame grant me strength you've got golden vow as a buff as well you don't have to use the buffs but buffs are pretty cool any other spells and incantations that you like you can use in this build because you've got access to them with the seal and the staff so ultimately this is like one of the most flexible caster slash sword user builds that you can go with so you've got so much that you can play around with and find what works for you the last build on this list is the blasphemous brawler this is a brawler build that uses the bestial incantations and the blasphemous blade to deal fire and physical damage the taker's flame ash of war deals fire damage in a line in front of you and restores your health by consuming the enemies that it touches you also get health back when killing enemies with this sword as well we're focusing on this kind of merely really like hard hitting aggressive brawler style build with the bestial incantations because i like the way that these two fit together being that the blasphemous blade stacks with strength and faith and the claw marks seal and like the bestial incantations feel very strength and faith focused so they kind of marry together really nicely the claw mark seal does go with strength and faith and you'll be using these bestial incantations like beast claw to reap the ground in front of you beast sling to you know throw pocket sand the stone of garak is a perfect like ranged option to throw a rock you've also got the bestial vitality to restore some of your health over time so you can use the sword to redeem your health as well as the bestial vitality to get even more health back 
it basically like stay in the fight indefinitely because of the amount of health recovery you just have naturally without even having to use your flask this build also synergizes great with flame great me strength because of the physical and fire damage that it does so for tougher enemies you've got that as well and this is honestly my favorite faith build you know as soon as i finished the game as an intelligence build the first thing i did was go and make this faith build because i knew i wanted to use this sword because it was really cool and all the bestial incantations that you get from the clergyman you know the homie because i spent all of my playthrough collecting all of the death roots and getting all these incantations that i couldn't even use because i was intelligent so i really wanted to test these out and i just love the synergies between these as well as the core mark seal it feels like it's like made this way as if they're supposed to go together so it's a perfect build but our primary stats for this build is faith and strength as mentioned you want to maximize these as much as possible your secondary stats are vigor mind and endurance as always you will want to find that balance between vigor and mind as you will need a bit of fp for the ash of war as well as casting the bestial abilities but then you also need that vigor for that health recovery because you're going to be taking a bit of that damage because you kind of like hit through a lot of stuff but you could use a shield with this build as well if you do want to but i don't think it's necessary you want to put the blasphemous blade in one hand and the claw mark seal in the other and for the most part unless you're casting with the seal actively you want to two hand the blasphemous blade you can use any armor for this build although i do like the briar set just because it fits nicely like it looks cool together to have these two married together but realistically you can you know wear anything for talismans godfrey icon again to boost the damage of your charge spells and skills shard of alexander to boost the damage of your ash of war taker's flame the carrigan freelagoon crest to reduce the fp cost of that ash of war and the fire scorpion talisman to increase your fire damage for spells here flame grant me strength for physical and fire damage increase the beast claw the beast deal sling the stone of garak and the beast deal vitality are all great you could put any other incantations in this build if you do choose to however these just fit the theme of this build that we're going for and i think they marry together nicely all right, so we're going to start out with the Star Caller, and this is a build that uses the Star Scourge Great Sword, which is extremely unique in that when you two-hand it, you actually get two Great Swords instead of just two-handing the one. This gives you unique light and heavy attack combos with your R1 and your R2, and this weapon does physical and magic damage, so it's really powerful for that in just its general attacks. Plus, it's Ash of War. The Star Caller Cry is just like ridiculous. It pulls enemies in, and then you slam your big Great Swords down on the ground, does great damage. However, I have decided to go a different route for this now because you are wielding two great swords what i've decided to focus on is that element rather than the ash war itself so we're using the claw talisman which will increase your damage when you do the jumping attack and with the jumping attack with these you're actually hitting with both of the great swords separately so you get additional benefits from that you can further increase that with the raptor's black feathers to increase your jump attack even further and just with your general like light heavy attack combos i'm also combining things like the rotten winged sword insignia so as you are doing these effects you will get consecutive attacks which will then increase your attack power even further so rather than going down that heavy into the ash of war route i've decided to make this a little bit more flexible and focusing on essentially just using this as less of a gimmick right do you know what i mean because a lot of these builds with these unique weapons are just solely focused on using the ash of war and just spamming that to basically win every fight and i'm trying to avoid doing that with this build and essentially just using it as i would essentially use a standard build where you know i might mix in some of the ash of war might just use some of the attacks so like combining those together and just generally playing how i feel like with this build putting this build together your main stat is obviously going to be strength but you will need a little bit of intelligence and dexterity around the 30s to 40 mark as the star scores great sword does scale well with intelligence and dex so putting some points into that will help your just damage overall your secondary stats really are vigor and endurance as much endurance as possible for that equip load while keeping your vigor high because you will take a little bit of damage with this build and a decent amount of mind wherever you can kind of fit that in as that other stat because you will need some to use the ash of war but it's not really critical here about 20 or so is completely fine no shield for this build the highest poise armor that you can possibly put on i'm wearing a combination of the bull goat set here with the raptors black feathers but keeping within medium roll so that i can actually roll with this build for talismans here we're using the ur trees favor to raise the maximum hp stamina and equip load as well as the claw talisman to enhance those jump attacks i tinkered with a lot of talismans here like the twin blade talisman to enhance the third attack of the chain combo with this but you could go something like the shard of alexander just to increase your overall damage or even the magic scorpion charm is a good option here just to increase your magic damage that these swords do and our last is the rotten winged sword insignia 
now to increase your attack power with successive attacks. Star Call Cry, the Ash of War is a huge part of this build. So you will use that, especially on groups of enemies. And then when you're really just fighting like bosses or things that you can't actually get that attack off, then you can just use those standard attacks and see success with it that way. We'll get into the next build after a word from today's sponsor. After a hard day's work at playing Elden Ring with my feet up, the hardest boss I'll face is not only deciding what to cook for dinner, but actually making it. HelloFresh makes cooking easy with 50 weekly options, including a rotating selection of items at HelloFresh Market. There are plenty of tasty dishes to choose from, no matter the occasion. HelloFresh offers veggie, pescatarian, fit and wholesome meals, quick and easy to make it easy to stick to whatever your goals are. I personally am pescatarian, so it's so easy to just change that setting, so I don't have to worry about getting something that I don't like. With HelloFresh, the step by step recipes are super easy to follow with pre portioned ingredients that help me cut out all the prep time so I can get back to working. We've kept all the recipes for the cards that we've collected over the years and we've turned them into like a fun little recipe book if we ever need to make something on the fly. We've got all of these recipes to choose from. The HelloFresh market means you've got one stop shop for all meals and snack occasions. They've got breakfast bites, savory soups, focaccias, pies, satisfying snacks and sides and desserts and even more. I use the falafel bites for all my lunches, they are delicious. Use my link or go to HelloFresh com and use the code POG SE13242. That's POG SE13242 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts across seven HelloFresh boxes. Thank you, HelloFresh, for sponsoring this video. And now it's time for this secret build that is also secret, I guess, because you probably just clicked at this point in the video. It's the Black Archer. Now, I bet you didn't think you were going to see an Archer build in this video, but I've been itching to make like an endgame version of my Archer build, the Bandit video that I made a long, long time ago. And what I figured out is really that if you level strength and dex together it gives you the best kind of output for an archer build essentially because all of the bows scale horrendously and do terrible damage but if you put up both strength and dex you can get the most bang for your buck in terms of scaling so that's what we've done this is a strength and dex hybrid build and how this works is essentially using the black bow as your primary weapon and it's barrage ash of war pretty much constantly and we want to be using as many arrows with this as possible to apply effects using say a serpent arrows or the blood Bone arrows. So blood blown will apply blood loss and the serpent arrows will apply poison. Now serpent arrows you can just buy in the game. There's a vendor that specifically sells them in Caleb. You can just buy these. So you can have infinite amounts of these, whereas the blood bone arrows are a little bit harder to get as you have to craft them yourself. But essentially the focus on here is applying statuses to the enemy and using those status effects to increase your damage output as an archer. And then we're also increasing our overall damage output by having a cane sword in our second hand, which has Sapuku on it. So you can apply blood loss on yourself for things that you can't apply blood loss immediately on in combat like a boss or something so you can trigger the blood loss effects for white mask and the lord of blood's exaltation and then switch back to the bow and then because the cane sword's still in your offhand even though you're two-handing the bow you'll still get the effect i'm also using a little bit of the pulley bow as like my secondary bow with mighty shot on it because mighty shot is great for thinning out enemies at a distance it does more damage than barrage as your ash of war but essentially you'll switch between these two bows for bosses i basically just use the black bow and then the pulley bow on some of the general trash mobs that i needed a bit more range to finish them off without them really getting anywhere near me. I don't often mention it in a lot of these build videos, but you should be using Ashes of War with this build, especially the Great Shield Ash of War. Those soldier boys will absolutely save your life a number of times because it will take the aggro off you and you can just stand around and shoot arrows. So you can absolutely combo with that. I mean, you obviously you don't have to, right? You can just run this as a build and you just got to get good at your dodges and you should be fine. Let's put this one together. Your primary stats here are strength and dexterity, as mentioned, level these together. Your secondary stats here are endurance and mind. You're going to need a lot of mind for because you're always going to be using those ash of wars the barrage the mighty shot as well as endurance for your stamina usage just for those ash of wars but as well as for dodging because you want to avoid damage completely with this build you want to dodge all of the time as well as that jump back attack that you do with the bow where you like jump back and like shoot during the air so you're going to be using tons of stamina so the more stamina you have the better vigor you will need a little bit but realistically if you're taking damage as an archer you've done something wrong and i mean you know fair enough i take damage all the time as an archer so you can absolutely see this video a number of times but really Realistically, you want to avoid taking damage as much as possible. We're using the black bow, the pulley bow, and the cane sword, as we've already talked about. Your armor, the white mask, is being worn here to increase your attack power when there's blood loss nearby. And then any light armor, you want to stay as light as possible with this build. And for your talismans, ritual sword talisman is pretty good to increase your attack power when your HP is full, because if you are taking damage, you're doing something wrong, as mentioned. Shard of Alexander to increase your damage with Ashes of War. Arrow Sting talisman is good here as well to increase the attack power of bows. 
and the Lord of Bloods Exaltation. Now, I have also tinkered with a few other different talismans here, like I've tinkered with the Dragon Shield talisman to reduce the amount of physical damage that I take, and it really depends on the kind of encounter that you are having, and it's one of the flexibilities about being an archer is just being flexible with the talismans that you're using, right? So, against a boss, you're probably not going to have your HP at maximum the entire time, so having the Ritual Sword talisman equipped maybe is not the best option to go with something like the Physical Negation talisman or something like that, and figuring out what really sits with this build is really beneficial to maximize your archer playthrough. Moving on to the last build, this is the Giant Crusher. This uses the Giant Crusher weapon, and I think it's the highest scaling strength weapon in the game. Let me know in the comments if I have that wrong, but I'm pretty sure it is. It has a unique R2 which smashes enemies into the ground, and I'm combining it with Flame Gap Me Strength to increase the physical damage a little bit, as well as the Bragget's Roar to further increase that damage, the defense, as well as stamina recovery, because they're all important for a build like this. And when you do use that Roar, it does change the R2 again to be a different R2, but the benefit here with Braggot's Roar is being a Roar attack, we can buff it with the Roar Medallion as well as the Highland Axe to do even more damage with those heavy R2s after you have Roar. Now that Roar only lasts 6 seconds, so you want to get those attacks off as quick as possible, but essentially once you've done that and you've buffed with this way, you're going to really shred through enemies. It's a really fun build and using a lot of stagger here because you're going to really stagger enemies with such a hard hitting weapon. Your primary stat here is Strength and then followed by Vigor and Endurance. The more Endurance you have, the better because you want to get that equip load up as high as possible. If you can avoid heavy rolling, absolutely do it. However, you could just go straight into Vigor here. And I put a lot into Endurance. You probably could drop that off and put either more into Strength and Vigor and just simply focus on, you know, not rolling at all, just standing there and taking those hits. Because in some regards, we are doing that right. I've also got Bestial Vitality equipped here. So I will get some health back in combat. So it doesn't matter too much, essentially, but you can really play around with what you see fit there. So the weapons we're using here is the Giant Crusher and the Highland Axe, as mentioned, the Claw Mark Seal for the Flame Grant Me Strength and Bestial Vitalities. Armor-wise, you want to put on that Bull Goat set completely because you want the poise for days with this build. You want to be able to stand there and just smack through all of the attacks that you do take. For your Talismans, the Erdtree's Favor, again, to raise your maximum HP, Stamina, and Equip Load is important here. We're also using the Raw Talisman to enhance the Raws and Breath Attacks, so the Braggot's Raw that we're using. The Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman, which enormously boots your physical damage and negation, is important for this build because we're going to be taking a lot of damage, and you're really just going to stand there and take hits a lot of times. So any way that you can reduce the damage you're taking is really important. Now, I also would put as your fourth talisman the Taker's Cameo to restore HP upon defeating enemies when you're just like fighting trash mobs because you're not really going to roll much. You can really just use this to get some HP back when you do take some of that damage. Otherwise, in some regards, like a bosses, that kind of thing, you could go with the Pearl Drake Talisman to reduce the amount of non-physical damage that you do take as this build. You can also buff your poise even further with the Flask of Wondrous Physique by putting the temporary poise bonus onto that as well. And the Spiked Cracked here is also important to buff your charged attack power because your R2 does become a charged attack once you have used the Braggus Raw and you can just really increase that damage as much as really humanly possible. And essentially there isn't much to say about this build other than put all these things on, put a lot of strength in and just stand there and smack away. There isn't much else to say. Like you're just really going to stand there, take damage and smack enemies in the face with the giant crusher. It's really fun to do. If you want more, I have over 60 videos on Elden Ring on the channel from tips and tricks to end game content, more builds, weapon rankings. There is plenty to check out. I'll link a playlist here for all of that good stuff if you want to dive in. But thank you for watching this video till the end. Thank you to our members for supporting the channel. My name is Norza and I hope you have a great day.